morning, a little bit of a different topic. One that's uh, of interest to us here in Tri Basin, especially in Kearney County, and uh, rusty pivots and nitrates. And this is a research project that was started a few years ago. The University of Nebraska Conservation and Survey Division has been working in cooperation with Tri Basin and Little Blue NRDs on some water quality research in Kearney and Downs counties. And one of the results is this. Uh, research on rusty pivots. And Dr. Troy Gilmore with the University of Nebraska and Michaela Cherry, who's a physical scientist with the U.S. Geological Survey in Nebraska, and talk about that. Michaela. Like John said, I'm Michaela Cherry. I'm currently with the USGS in our Lincoln office. Um, but the work I'm going to talk to you about today is from some of the PhD work that I did when I was at the University of Nebraska. So, um, the title of this project and paper is A Pivotal New Approach to Groundwater Quality Assessment. And if you're interested in the full paper, um, feel free to contact me and I'll send you, send you the article um, afterwards. Um, so, the focus of this study is South Central Nebraska and Phelps Kearney and Adams County um, for two reasons. One, there are a lot of pivots here. Um, and the second one is that we were already doing research here, so it made it really easy to add this on as something that we wanted to look at. And so, as a lot of you guys already know, this is a heavily irrigated area. There's lots of pivots. Um, historically, the area was um, irrigated with flood irrigation um, from canals and it's kind of switched over to more center pivots. Um, but there's still approximately 50% of the land use is irrigated, um, generally with center pivots. Um, and like a lot of the rest of the groundwater nitrate is a concern. Um, this area also has a fun little groundwater mound phenomenon from those canals historically. This doesn't really relate to the pivots, but it is kind of background and I hadn't gotten a chance to use this animation in a presentation yet, and I was very proud of it, and I wanted to. So, um, you can kind of see the groundwater mound in the top figure, and then the bottom figure is kind of showing how the water that originated in that mound has moved as you get deeper in the groundwater. So, as you kind of see the mound shift to the, what would be the east, is as you're going deeper in the project. So, back to pivots. Um, one of the main reasons that we kind of got interested in this study is Marty Staney at Hastings Utility said to Troy one day, oh, we don't have to worry about groundwater nitrate over there, we have red pivots. Which is kind of a random thing to say if you're not familiar with the area. And so we got to thinking, well, you know, Marty knows the area really well. There might be something, you know, looking into this further, it might not just be like that one specific area in Hastings. Can we use how pivots look to predict the groundwater underneath, specifically in terms of nitrate. And since we've got a lot of pivots, it's a great place to look at it. And so what we did is we looked at 700 pivots on Google Earth, which was a lot of me staring very closely at a computer screen, looking at those pivots, the like very tiny line on Google Earth, and trying to see, can I tell a difference between a red pivot, a silver pivot, any other kind of pivot there might be. Um, so I looked at a lot of them, and then to see if I was right or not, I went out and looked at 250 of those pivots in person um, with my sister as my field assistant that summer. And we photographed all of them, and then we compared, does the Google Earth um, classification match up with our in-person classification? And so we kind of classified them pretty loosely as fully rusty, partly rusty, and then no rust. And I'm going to probably use rust and red interchangeably. I do not mean that these pivots are corroding in any way, just that they kind of have that rust stained color. Um, and it's a lot easier to say rusty pivot than to say pivot that appears to be coated with a red you know, staining. So just so you guys know. Um, and overall, the pivots did a really good job on Google Earth as classifying them in a couple cases. So this is probably a bit harder for you to see since your face is not pressed up against the computer screen. But on the top, we have a fully rusty pivot. And you can kind of see on Google Earth, it does look red. And then, oh, that's better. And then this is that same pivot in person. And as you can see, you can see that same red rust color. Um, for figures C and D, we have a non-rusty pivot. It looks kind of silvery blue on Google Earth. 
and it looks like a silvery metallic pivot in person. Where this methodology kind of falls apart a little bit, at least for Google Earth, is when you get down to drop nozzle pivots, on Google Earth, they look like a non-rusty pivot, but when you see them in person, that lower half has that red stain color, but it's not on the top. Because of that drop nozzle, the water's not coating the top of the pivot. Um, and so you can sometimes tell like the very end of one of these pivots on Google Earth um, will kind of look red, but it's, it's a little hard to tell sometimes. And then sometimes there are other pivots where you see it on Google Earth and you have no idea what you are looking at no matter how much you zoom in. Um, so you can see a really nice shadow of this pivot on Google Earth, but it's really hard to see the actual pivot itself. And so overall, Google Earth was good about 83% of the time in correctly identifying what that pivot looked like in person. And in cases where it didn't do a good job are where you have those drop nozzle pivots so you can't really see that rust um, from the top of the pivot on the Google Earth. Um, sometimes the pivot will have been replaced since that Google Earth photo was taken, so it might have been rusty on Google Earth. You go on, it's bright, shiny, brand new when you see it in person, or vice versa, it looked nice and new on Google Earth, but by the time you saw it in person, um, you had already had that rust staining on it. And so, again, you know, like you've been talking about pivots for a long time. We then took all of that data that we had on our pivots and correlated it with the groundwater nitrate concentration for those pivots. And from here we learned a couple of things. The first thing we learned that is if you have a non-rusty pivot, it will tell you absolutely nothing about the groundwater nitrate underneath. You might have no groundwater nitrate, you might have really high nitrate, it doesn't really tell you anything. Which makes sense because, you know, it's just, it's just a pivot, we have them all over. Um, there's not a lot of information you can gain from it. However, when we have our partially rusty and our fully rusty pivots, we can see that the overall groundwater nitrate concentration is much lower. And so this matches up with what Marty had said with red pivots having low groundwater nitrate. And so it was really nice to see that in those hundreds of pivots that we looked at, we saw the same thing. And from now you might be wondering, well, why is that? Like there's nothing instinctively correlating nitrate and rust on pivots, and why on earth do you even have these rusty pivots anyways? And so, um, the next thing we kind of wanted to look at was, well, maybe all of these pivots that are rusty are really, really deep, and that's why they don't have any nitrate, and it has nothing to do, you know, like with the pivots themselves or anything else. So we went and we plotted up our pivots to see if maybe only the really deep pivots were where we were seeing this groundwater nitrate, and that didn't end up being the case in general. We had non-rusty pivots at all depths, and then our rusty and partly rusty pivots, they kind of appear in this clump with a lot of the other pivots, so they're not particularly deep compared to the other ones. Um, and so we were like, well, what do they look like spatially? And here we found that in general, the rusty pivots tend to appear in groups or in clumps. And so this is an interpolated map. I'm not saying that everywhere you see this, you'll find a rusty pivot in all those places. But in general, the rusty pivots kind of happen in the same general area, and you tend to find pockets of rusty pivots together. These up here near Hastings are kind of what Marty was talking about. You get this like really dense clump of rusty pivots happening. They're not necessarily happening randomly. If we look at that compared to our groundwater nitrate, we can see, yeah, in the areas that we have the rusty pivots, we generally have lower groundwater nitrate as well. And then you might have guessed by me saying rust and rusty a lot that we wanted to look at the groundwater iron to see what role it's playing. And in general, you don't have as many groundwater iron concentrations, but places of elevated iron have also low nitrate and the rusty pivots. So they're kind of all tied in together. Um, so next we're gonna talk about the proposed mechanism as to why we think this is happening. Um, but I'm just gonna preface this by saying this is just a theory that hasn't been fully tested. So we know we have the rusty pivots and we have the low nitrate, and so to try and figure out why that might be, we have to talk about um, fun little microbes and how nitrate might be removed. So um, once we have some sort of fertilizer, any sort of nitrogen input into our soil, it gets carried down with rain, irrigation, some sort of water, and now we have it in our groundwater. So it might stay there for an indeterminate amount of time, it might flow with the groundwater and discharge into a stream or a spring, 
or it might go through a process called denitrification, in which nitrate becomes N2, um, and then we don't have to worry about it. N2 is harmless, it makes a lot of the atmosphere, we're not concerned about it. Um, so things going through denitrification is really handy if that's what's happening. And so for that to happen, we need three things. We need microbes that exist in the soil, we need nitrate to denitrify, and we need organic carbon. And so these microbes occur in our soil and our groundwater, and they have a preferential diet. They are very lazy and they will eat what is easiest first. And so the first thing that they want to eat is oxygen. So up near the surface, near the water table, there's a lot of dissolved oxygen in our groundwater and the microbes are going to eat that first. Once the microbes and the nitrate have migrated a bit further in our aquifer, um, they need enough all the oxygen, they can't use that anymore, and the next thing they're going to move on to is nitrate. So our microbes will now preferentially eat all the nitrate, transforming it into N2, and the denitrification has occurred, and so we have low groundwater nitrate in those areas. And so here we have our little microbe, it's eating all our nitrate, and as you might guess by looking at our microbe diet, it eventually gets down to iron. So if iron is present, um, and this doesn't occur if it's not there, but if there's iron, the microbes will eat the iron and reduce it to F2. And so now we have a bunch of iron that's been reduced in our groundwater, and we think what is happening is that iron is then being pumped up along with all the water for irrigation. Once it's exposed to the atmosphere again, it oxidizes or rusts, and you get this rust coating on all of the pivots. And for some of you who might have been working here for a long time, you might have experienced this firsthand. Um, and so here's just an example of a drop nozzle pivot, and you can see that even on parts of the pivot that aren't necessarily like fully the metallic metal parts of the pivot, you still get that kind of rusty coating of this iron that's been pumped up and oxidized. So this is what we think is happening um, because we know we have high iron in the groundwater um, and we know we have these rusty pivots and we think it's all tied in with that nitrate and denitrification as well. Um, so, in conclusions, we learned that you can use Google Earth to identify where rusty pivots might occur and they tend to occur in these patches so once you found one you can kind of zoom around and find more. Um, we also determined that areas that had those rusty pivots also had low nitrate below that 10 milligrams per liter that gets, you know, talked about a lot as being the, the standard. Um, and that these low groundwater nitrate concentration, rusty pivots, and elevated, elevated groundwater iron all kind of occur in these same areas. And so we're hoping that this information can be used in the future for um, uh, water managers and other entities to look at areas where maybe if we have rusty pivots you don't need to sample there quite as often you can target your focus because there's only so many sampling dollars right you can target your focus to other areas that might be a concern or look in areas of um, emerging irrigation there's a lot of places around the world that are increasing the irrigation and having irrigation where they didn't have it before you can use those as areas to look at these are areas that maybe groundwater nitrate will be a concern or won't be a concern um, and so we're also doing future research to look at more of that mechanism between the iron and the groundwater nitrate to see exactly what that connection is. Um, so I will happily take any questions. This is the same data as the um, nitrate concentration map. I just paired it with pivots. Um, and I'm going to throw my information up on the screen in case anyone would like it. And because I'm USGS, I have to throw all the information up on the screen. But, Okay, thank you, Michaela. Uh, I got a question. Innovative research, yes, go ahead. So what's your next step of evaluation? Um, so the next step would be looking more in depth at those iron concentrations and pivot areas to see what exactly is that coating on the pivot, like what is it made up of? Um, can we determine more about how the um, nitrate and iron play in the denitrification process to give it a better idea of what's going on? Are you going to do a study of build-up per year of anything? Are you going to study that over a long time? A certain amount build-up over a year makes a difference from anything? We haven't looked at it, but that's a good idea because, you know, like, 
the buildup does, you know, occur, maybe it occurs faster or slower depending on the iron and it, that might impact how nitrates move through the system. Okay, thank you. Other questions for Michaela? Right, thank you, Michaela. Sorry. Oh, well, yeah, well, yeah. No, just go ahead. So, are you thinking that this rust helps the pivot last longer because it protects it? Or does it make it go into <laughs> corrosion? Okay, so I did talk with um, a few people from Valley Irrigation, and they are of the belief, don't ask me, my family's from Southeast Kansas, so we don't irrigate. Um, but uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not an expert on pivots yet. Um, but they are of the belief that this is just an iron coating that's not corroding the pivots, and so I wouldn't necessarily say it makes the pivot last longer or shorter, but in theory it shouldn't be shortening the life of the pivot. Um, they would not share their super secret corrosion pivot calculation with me. Um, perhaps some of you know what it is or have your own calculation. Um, but uh, they did share some of the information that they look at for when pivots corrode. And um, I don't have the figure of that in that presentation, but I did plot it all up and this area of Nebraska shouldn't really be seeing um, excessive corrosion due to things like um, chloride and hardness and other things in the, in the water. The microbe that contributes to the denitrification, mm -hmm. does it not exist or not exist in as big in numbers in areas where we see high nitrate? Perhaps. Um, so one of the things you do need for denitrification is for those microbes to exist and for organic carbon to exist. And so in areas where you're not seeing denitrification, it might be that you don't have the right set of microbes, they are not in the right conditions, or it also might be, um, generally when you have really shallow groundwater, you're never getting past the point where they've used up all the oxygen. So if they have a continuous source of oxygen, they're just gonna continue to eat that over and over and over, and they'll never get to the next step. So that's um, part of the equation as well. Along, along those lines, yep. the, that microbial activity, the organic material, is it related at all to you know practices and on the working world? I do not know the answer to that, Troy. Do you know? I'm gonna put him on the spot. Yeah, we have a you're asking you were asking about a direct relationship with yeah. ag practices and things like that. To increase we, organic material in the soil. Yeah, we haven't looked at that. Um, a lot of that's Above, you know, we were really focusing water table and below uh, in this particular work, but it's an interesting question. Okay, any other questions for Mikhail? Thank you very much, Mikhail.